Good morning, everybody, and welcome. My name is Anthony Kazazis, and I am the director of the NYC Network Group, as well as the NYC Real Estate Expo. Today, we are going to learn from renowned sales trainer, Jeremy Miner of the seventh level, what it takes to reach seven figures in personal income as a real estate broker. Jeremy is one of the top five global sales trainers to entrepreneurs and companies alike. The keynote is titled Three Steps for You to Master, to Stand Out, and to Sell to Today's Cautious Skeptical Buyers. The single most effective way to sell anything to anyone in 2021 is to be a problem finder and a problem solver, not a product pusher. Very true. Jeremy Miner, the embodiment of his philosophy, has made him one of the wealthiest sales professionals on the planet. During his 17 years career, he was recognized by the Direct Selling Association as the 45th highest earning producer out of more than 100 million salespeople selling anything worldwide. Jeremy's earnings as a commission only salesperson were in the multiple seven figures every year. He is the chairman of Seventh Level, a global sales training company with its headquarters in Sydney, Australia. Jeremy's particular brand of sales training pioneers the unique use of behavioral science and human psychology within the sales process. His scientific method of selling created by Jeremy has helped over 140,000 salespeople in 37 countries over the last three years to three times, five times, even 10 times their sales results. He's been featured in Forbes, US Today, Inc., Entrepreneur Magazine, Thrive Global, Yahoo Finance, Disrupt Magazines, and a host of other publications on the topic of sales, persuasion, and role of psychology in human behavior in the buying process. Seventh Level's mission is to generate significant and sustainable increase in your business performance, sales, and revenue. Previous performance on the personal and corporate level demonstrates how possible this really is. Seventh Level's clients include Fortune 500 companies, all the way to SMB companies, down to individual salespeople selling anything. His new book, The New Model of Selling, Selling to an Unsellable Generation, um, co-authored by Jerry Cuff, CEO of Delta Point, is being published early fall of 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Jeremy Miner. Anthony, uh, that, that was really nice of you to say all that stuff. I'm going to take all of that as a compliment because my kids say that I'm really boring. Oh, so man. I need to remind them sometimes that, that every once in a while, dad can do something okay. I really, I, I appreciate you being on here. Yeah, man, I tell you, that resume was impressive. And I'm going to enjoy that this. Cool, man. <laughs> but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to enjoy this. And I'm going to let you have the full stage. So I'm going to disappear. And I'm going to come back out and... Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions, please upload them into the Q&A section, not the chat section. And just in case if we can't answer them all, we will copy them, give them to Jeremy, and his team will answer thereafter, if, even after the event. So, Jeremy, it's all yours. I'll see you later. All right, let's do it. And I want you to write this down. All selling is, is change. All sales are about one thing and that's change. Whether they want something better, your prospects, or they're trying to get away from pain, all selling is, is change. It's how good you are at helping your prospect see in their mind that changing their situation, paying for your services, product, in your case as an agent, real estate agent, getting the listing or selling them a property is far less riskier than them doing nothing at all, staying in the status quo, and their problems stay the same, and nothing ever changes for them. Now, here's your problem, though. Your potential customers don't like change, even though they say they do. Why? Because it makes human beings feel unsettled and uncomfortable, particularly when it's initiated by salespeople who are ready to pitch their services. Research shows that human beings do not like change much at all. Repeatedly, human behavior shows that we value tradition, consistency, and something that is familiar, even if we don't even like it that much, over something that is new and foreign to us. Realize this, you're not selling the thing. In your case, you're not selling them a home, 
you're selling them the results of that new home. Maybe it's a safer neighborhood that they want to be in. Maybe they're moving away from pain because their neighborhood is not as good anymore. Maybe the home gives them more status in the community and that's what they emotionally need. Or maybe the home has more bedrooms because their family has grown. That's what you're selling. You're selling the results of that thing, not the home itself. Now write this down since we're virtual. Today, I'm gonna to give you three steps that you'll need to understand and master to get your prospects to want to change and be able to sell at the very highest level to today's cautious, skeptical buyers. Now, I'm gonna start off here by asking you this question. And I know that we're all virtual, so it's a little bit different. I can't see all of you, but I want you to think about this very deeply. Why are you a salesperson? Why are you an agent? What is the purpose of you being in sales? What is the actual purpose of you being in sales? Now, a lot of times when we're training at live events before COVID, I ask that question and so many people, most salespeople say something like this. Well, Jeremy, I got into sales so I can make more money. I wanna make a lot of money. I, I just, I don't wanna be on a salary, I wanna make money. Or they'll say, you know, I got into sales because I just want to be free. Like, I don't want to have a boss. I want to be able to have flexibility with my schedule. Or I want to have more freedom to pursue my passions. And, you know, I, that's why I got into sales. And those are all really good answers. But if you answer that way, then ask yourself, on whom is your answer more focused on? You or your potential customer? Well, is a course focused on you and your own agenda. However, the fact is you're not in business or sales for you, you're in business for other people, right? So the purpose of you being in sales is to find and help other people solve their problems. So step number one, write this down and we'll post it here in the chat. Step number one is you have to learn to become a problem finder and problem solver, not a product pusher. Become a problem finder, problem solver, not a product pusher. Now make sure you write that down. Now, think about this. Do your prospects in your industry have problems? Do they have problems? I want you to take a second real quick. Go ahead and write down two problems. So if you've got a pen and a piece of paper, wherever you're at, write down two of the main problems that your prospects that you talk to every day, every week, every month have. What are the two biggest problems that your prospects have? I'm gonna give you a few seconds. I want you to write those down on a piece of paper. We're gonna do the old Jeopardy thing, do, do, do. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a couple more seconds. What are the two biggest problems that your prospects have? Okay, hopefully you've written them down or you've got them in your mind. Now, I want you to take a look at the two problems that you wrote down that your prospects have. Now, wherever you're at, I guess if you're in New York or wherever you're at here virtually, raise your hand where you're at if your solution solves those. So look at the two problems. Raise your hand if your solution, if you can solve those two problems. So what I think that I'm probably virtually hearing from you or saying in your mind or you're thinking is that your prospects have problems you have the solution to solve those. So the question is, if your prospects have problems and your solution solves those, then why are they not working with you? Why are they not buying from you? Why are they not listing their properties with you? What's the missing link? Can I make a suggestion? The missing link is, it's not your leads. It's not your mindset. It's not that you don't listen to enough Tony Robbins or personal development every day to get motivated. It's not that you don't work hard. How many of you work your butt off to the ground five, six, seven days a week? Probably all of you listening to me. Here's what it is, if I could suggest. It's what you are saying, or more importantly, not asking, that's causing your prospects to run the other way and not buy your solution. And if they don't buy, then you can't solve their problems. 
Now, once you learn the right things to say and you learn the right questions to ask to your prospects and when and how to ask those questions, what becomes possible for you as a sales professional, as an agent? Well, here's what becomes possible. You make a lot more sales. You can double, you can triple, you can quadruple your income and your sales overnight. You see, remember as sales professionals, we are in fact problem finders and problem solvers. It's not enough in the day and age we live in today. Now, in our company, when we train salespeople and companies, we call the day and age we're in the post-trust era. Write that down. It's not enough in the post-trust era that we're in right now to be excellent at just solving problems. Hell, you can go to any bookstore on planet Earth or go to Amazon and any sales book you ever buy will tell you that you have to be good at solving problems. But that's not going to give you any competitive advantage over other agents trying to get the same listing or sell that home. It won't. You must now be even better at problem finding. Now, that's asking the right questions at the right time to help your prospects uncover challenges and problems that they didn't even know they had. We have to realize that most of your prospects, when you first start talking to them, don't even realize they have a problem. Or maybe they understand they have this problem, but through your questioning, you're able to help them find two or three or four other problems that they didn't know they had. Or maybe they don't know how bad their problems really are or what the consequences or ramifications are if they don't do anything about solving them, like how bad it could be. Because if we can't help them uncover the problems in their own mind through your questioning ability, that's impossible for them to ever feel the need or urgency to ever want to work from us or buy from us. Now, what are most salespeople? Ugh, I hate to say this. Most salespeople are called what we call product pushers. Don't be a product pusher. Most salespeople have been trained to do what? Well, they've been trained how to ask a few logical based questions. In your case, like, what are you looking for in a home, John? Or what's your budget for a property? Or when are you looking to move or buy a new home? And then what do they do? They go into their pitch their sales pitch, talking about the features and benefits of their services and how we have the best this and we have the best that and you should be working with us and you shouldn't be working with them, which by the way, every salesperson that you've ever met says they have the best service or product, right? How many salespeople or agents do you know that tell their prospects they have the fifth best service in the market or in your case, they're the eighth best agent in the office? No one does. Everyone says they have the best or they are the best. So it's like taking a bucket of mud, throwing it up against the wall, hoping and praying that something they say will just trigger their prospects to magically want to buy from them. I call that hopium. It's like a drug that so many salespeople are on where they just hope and pray something they're going to say is going to trigger the prospect to want to work with them, want to buy from them. And that's such a hard and unpredictable way to make a living. You see, we've always been told that great salespeople are excellent at problem solving. They can assess their prospects' needs, ask a few questions, and then deliver the right solution. And this ability to solve your prospects' problems does matter to your success. But today, when information is abundant and accessible, rather than limited and hard to find, well, it matters a lot less. You see, if your prospect knows precisely what their problem is, whether they're hoping to buy a new computer or take a five-day cruise, well, guess what? They can find all that information to make a decision without you. The services of salespeople are far more valuable when your prospects are mistaken, confused, or clueless about what their true problems really are. In those situations, the ability to persuade others hinges far less on problem solving and far more on problem finding. You see, only a short time ago, buyers faced several challenges to solving problems on their own. They had to rely on us. They had to rely on salespeople because the salesperson had access to information that the buyer did not have access to. 
But in our time, 2021, with the power of the internet and especially social media, that information is at your buyer's fingertips. All they need is their smartphone to look up everything. This technology has completely reshaped the sales process. The just trust me, I know what I'm doing, or the just trust me line is no longer relevant in the new age of selling that we live in. You see, being a problem finder is one of the biggest areas that separate a salesperson who's just getting average results, who's just getting by, to a salesperson who is at the very pinnacle, the very top of their field, one who makes hundreds of thousands of dollars a year or millions of dollars a year as a professional salesperson or agent. Your anxiety about calling your prospects or cold calling. Now, you know what I mean when I say that. I know you do. We train a lot of realtors. Your anxiety about calling your prospects or cold calling to try to get listings will be completely eliminated once you learn what we call NEPQ. Now, write this down. That stands for Neuro Emotional Persuasion Questions. So write that down, Neuro Emotional Persuasion Questions. You know that telephone at the end of your desk that you're probably looking at right now? The one that when you start calling your leads or cold calling feels like a thousand pounds, like a ton of concrete? Well, that phone, when you learn these skills, when you learn to become a top 1% salesperson, will literally float into your hands and you'll be internally excited every day to call people and have quality conversations that lead to sales, that lead to solving their problems. Now, write this down. This is very important. Remember to always let go of your outcome and your income will always increase. I'm gonna repeat that. Always let go of your outcome and your income will always increase. Now, this is going to require you to do something that very few salespeople in the world know how to do. Only the masters who've been taught how to do this know this. We call them legends. They're not born with this. They learn and they acquire and they are trained how to do this. They acquire these skills. And that's this. You have to learn how to detach yourself from the expectations of making the sale and instead focus on whether there's a sale to be made in the first place. I'm gonna repeat that. Everybody's like, what? No way, I can't do that. You have to learn how to detach yourself from the expectations of making the sale and instead focus on whether there's a sale to be made in the first place. I want you to feel the difference when you think this way. You see, by detaching yourself from the outcome of making the sale, what happens? You automatically become more open to feeling, to understanding and hearing what your potential customer's problems are, if any, and whether you can help them. This will enable you to become far more creative in your own mind on ideas on how you can solve their problems. Your prospects will start to view you. Watch the shift in their eyes and their mind and the way they talk. They'll start to view you as the trusted expert, the trusted authority, rather than just another salesperson who's trying to stuff their solution down their throat. You see the difference in that? It's so much easier to sell when you learn how to get your prospects to pull you in, pull you in and chase you down rather than you trying to push, push, push and then start having to chase them down. Okay, so we just went over step number one, becoming a problem finder and problem solver not a product pusher. All right, this is going to get more interesting. Now let's go over step number two, and I want you to write this down. Asking the right questions at the right time in the conversation. Asking the right questions at the right time in the conversation is step number two. Now, like Anthony mentioned earlier, I did go to college for a while. I actually dropped out my senior year, 11 credits short, because I got bored. But when I was in college, I majored in behavioral science and human psychology. Okay, we took a lot of classes on neuroscience, which is the study of the brain and how human beings make decisions and how and why people are persuaded and or not persuaded. So check this out. 
According to behavioral science, there are three forms of communication. I'd suggest you write these down because once you understand the differences in persuasion and where you are now in your sales ability, even if you're making good money, compared to where you could be, it will completely change everything for you. So the first mode of communication, what is called era one, E-R-A, era one type of sales, according to behavioral science, we are, write this down, the least persuasive. So we're the least persuasive when we tell people things or we attempt to dominate them, posture them, manipulate them, or push them into doing something we want them to do. Think boiler room selling or wolf on Wall Street type of selling. Hey, I got a great opportunity for you. Then you talk about the features and benefits of what you do. And then you push and tell them why they need to work with you and why they need to buy from you. It's just like if you tell your spouse that they need to do something for you and then you push them to try to get them to do it. Well, what do they typically do back? They push back. That's just human behavior one-on-one. -on -one. So let me give you a few examples of the least persuasive way to sell. Take a look. Presenting. What? Jeremy, no. I have to have a great presentation with my 50 decks slide deck of my pitch deck. And it has to have all these colors of my corporate office and how many awards we've won from the Better Business Bureau and all these awards. And then people will just buy. Oh, no. I hate to tell you that. We're all taught that you have to have a great presentation and show them how great your services are and, and what you do and all the client testimonials that we have the best this and the best that, which once again, by the way, doesn't every salesperson or agent say they have the best services, the best product? How many salespeople do you know that say their services are the fifth best in the market? No one, right? They all say they are the best or they have the best. So your prospects actually trust you less when you say things like that or you talk bad about your competitors because they are used to every single salesperson saying that to them. It goes in one ear, out the other. According to the data, it's not very persuasive if your presentation is more than 10% of that sales conversation. The average presentation for most salespeople is almost 50%. We have to tone it down to about 10%. We'll go over that in a while. What about telling your story? I hate to tell you this. Nobody cares about your story when you're selling one-on-one. -on -one. Whose story do they care about? They only care about their story. What about giving a sales pitch? We've all been taught that you've got to give a great pitch, Julie. You've got to give a great pitch, Gary. But according to the science, very low on the persuasive pole. You ever watch Shark Tank when the entrepreneurs come in and pitch their product to the shark? Do you ever notice the body language of the sharks when they start to pitch the sharks? You ever look at Damon John or Mark Cuban or Barbara? Do you see their facial expressions? You got to stop the pitch. Hashtag ditch the pitch. We actually have t-shirts in our company that say that. What about this? Putting sales pressure on them. Do you do that? And the big one, assuming the sale, according to the data, is very low on the persuasion pole. Hence the term sales is a numbers game. That's where it comes from because that way of selling causes it to be a numbers game, especially if you're in a more complex selling environment that requires multiple calls and touches, which all of you are. Now, be real with me. How many of you use these techniques or were taught to use them? Be real. Now, I want to make sure you understand. It's not your fault that you were taught them. All of you have learned those. I know you have. We were all taught them. I was taught them myself when I first got into sale, and I really struggled. Now, the second form of communication is called ERA, E-R-A, two type of sales. And we are more persuasive when we attempt to have an actual discussion. That's known as consultative selling. Came out in the 1980s with books like Spin Selling, which was groundbreaking at that point, where they taught you how to ask logical-based questions to find out the needs of the client. But what's the potential downfall of this approach when you're only asking logical-based questions? We call those surface-level questions. Well, when you ask logical-based questions, your prospect is gonna give you logical-based answers in return. 
And do people buy on logic or emotion? Emotion. Brain studies show 100% that it's emotion at this point. They just justify it after they purchase with logic. Now, here's some examples of consultative questions that trigger sales resistance. Please, for the love of Mary and all things that are holy, never use these. They are so outdated. Your prospects have heard them 10,000 times in the last month, and they're just surface level questions. You're never going to pull out much emotion unless they're just a lay down sale. Okay. Uh, John, you know, it's very nice to have you over here in the office uh, thinking about listing your property. Tell me this what's keeping you awake at night? Do you ask that question? Or Sally, can you tell me two problems that you're having the most and, and why you might be looking for a different property? Boring, surface level. Who besides you would be involved in this decision? Boring, surface level. What are you looking for in a solution? Or in your case, what are you looking for in a new property? Boring. Once again, surface level question. And you have to learn how to go far deeper than that if you want to pull out any of their emotions and create massive urgency to help them want to change their situation and list the property with you, buy from you. What about this one? What sort of budget do you have set aside for a home? Boring, surface level. Now, who in here was taught to ask those questions or is using them right now in your sales process? I'm guilty as charged. I know some of you. Throw them out the door if you want to make a lot more money and help a lot more people as a salesperson or agent. So once again, more persuasive than the first mode of telling your story, putting sales pressure on them and assuming the sale, but you're still playing the numbers game because very little emotion is brought out by simply asking logical based surface level questions. Now, the third mode of communication, which is called ERA, E-R-A, three type of sales. Can't pronounce things. You know, we're from Arkansas. My mom always says we, we don't know how to pronounce things down there. I don't know what's going on. All right. So we are more persuasive, the most persuasive, when we allow others to persuade themselves. What? How do you do that? That's called dialogue when we ask what are called neuro-emotional persuasion questions. That stands for NEPQ. Okay, here's the question. And I know you're asking me, well, Jeremy, that sounds good, but how do we get others to persuade themselves? Well, that's the million or the $10 million question. Do you just show up and give your prospects permission to persuade themselves? Like, hey, go ahead and persuade yourself. And, and by the way, uh, here's where you send me the money. No, of course you don't. You have to learn specific skilled questions and when and how to ask them in a step-by-step -step system or structure that will get your prospects to sell themselves rather than you trying to do it. Now, I want you to ask yourself this question. You got to be real with me and yourself. Are you a one, two, or three era type of salesperson? And be honest with where you're at now, not where you want to be. Okay, now our data shows when we survey salespeople that we train in companies or events, here's the stats, write this down. The first era of selling, which is to push them, pitch them, assume the sale, wolf of Wall Street, boiler room selling, sell on the opportunity. Hey, I got a great opportunity for you that was primarily taught in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, even as far back as the 1920s. Guess how many people still sell some portion of that? 73%. Three out of every four, 73% are still pushing, pitching, and assuming the sale. And it doesn't matter the industry that runs straight across the board. And a lot of people don't even think they're that pushy. But when you hear their calls, they're really aggressively pushing. Now, the second era of selling, asking consultative, logical-based questions to find the need, came out in the 80s and 90s with books like Spin Selling. 26% that we survey are still an era two type of selling. So what about the most persuasive way to sell? What's the percentage using that? The third mode, the most persuasive way according to behavioral science, getting the prospect to persuade themselves with neuroemotional persuasion questions is a little bit less than 1%. So here's the challenge with that. If you're still using era one and era two techniques that work against human behavior, 
that trigger sales resistance, where the wall goes up right when you start talking to them. But today's information aged buyers, consumers are in the era of three way of thinking. Today's consumer does not want to be talked at and sold to. They want to be asked, heard, and most importantly, understood. Well, if they're thinking one way, but salespeople are using techniques the other, do you see the friction of why you're not able to make or sell as much as where you really want to be? You just might be still using techniques. It's not your fault. You didn't know. You might be using techniques that for the most part are outdated from 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 plus years ago when the consumer has completely changed in the last few years. Now, luckily, all of that can be fixed. All of that can change for you. Now, I want you to write this down. I'm going to get a drink of water. The true essence of selling, contrary to what you might have been taught in your job by your company or that you've read in books or you've learned from what we call the old sales gurus or even had used on you, is not about convincing. It's not about persuading. It's not about manipulating or pushing someone into doing something you want them to do. It's not about that at all. That's what average salespeople do. Selling is not adversarial. It's not you against the prospect trying to win them over so you can make a commission. You've got to get rid of commission breath. Selling is collaborative. It's collaborative. You working with your prospects to help them find problems they didn't know they had and then help them solve those problems. And because of that, you make a lot of money to do that. So when you start off by telling your prospects all about you and your company and your services and your solutions too early in the conversation, you're more than likely going to cause sales resistance very quickly. And then what happens almost every time? You know what happens. Your prospects throw out all these objections. Well, your services don't do this. We need that. Or these fees you're charging are too expensive. We don't have the budget. Let me think it over. I need to talk to my spouse or my business partner or my CPA or my financial advisor or my aunt who lives in Poland or my uncle who lives in a van down by the river. Or I read a review online that's negative about your company or what about this or what about that, right? Because of the way you might have been taught how to communicate using traditional selling techniques, most salespeople usually get objections thrown in their face very quickly. And then what do they do? Well, they start arguing with the potential customer, throwing out rebuttals that just trigger more sales resistance. Then they start going over the stats and the facts to try to convince and close the prospect, which as we know, very rarely work on most of today's consumers. So when I'm talking about using NEPQ questions, I'm not referring to questions that you probably already learned that are designed to get people to say what you want them to say. The questions I'm referring to are questions that are intended to bring out people's inner and external truths. It's most importantly, their emotional feelings. It's them talking about themselves to you because after all, who knows the most about your potential customer? Them or you? Well, they do, of course. So write this down. Don't try to persuade them. Learn the skills to get them to persuade themselves. Now, the question is, how do you get somebody to do that? You have to realize that your potential client has all of their history. They know all of their needs. They have all the answers you will ever need to make the sale right up in here in their head. Now, you, on the other hand, you know which problems your solution solves. So you can recognize whether specific aspects of your solution will work for this potential customer. Then you can easily explain it to them in a way that connects the dots in their mind and makes 100% sense to them. All you really need are the right questions. You need the key to unlock their subconscious mind. It's really that simple. However, you also need to know when to ask the questions with the right tonality and right delivery so the prospect will want to open up to you, will want to engage with you. Because they're not just going to open up and engage if you say, hey, open up and engage. You have to learn the right questions that allow them to want to. Asking questions will eliminate the need for you to present, tell your story, use old school closing techniques, or even objection handling techniques. Because who eliminates most of the objections and concerns in the sales conversation. Well, they do, of course, because they're the ones talking about themselves and revealing their problems to you 
But more importantly, they're revealing the problems to who? Well, themselves. You see, in today's era three environment, the sale's not made or lost at the end of the sale with the closing technique that goes wrong or an objection handling skill. It's now made or lost from the beginning of the sales process. It actually starts at hello. Let me give you an example of this. Let's say someone called your office today or even walked in the front door of your building where you work at. Let's say if you're not working virtually anymore, wherever you're at. And they say something like this. This is a salesperson walking in or somebody walking in. You don't know they're in sales yet. And they immediately say this. Hi, uh, my name is Jake. I'm with XYZ Company. And what we do is, or hi, my name is Cindy. I'm with XYZ Company. And the reason why I'm calling you today is click. What usually goes through your mind in the first five seconds? Salesperson, right? You automatically expect the person to start their sales pitch. And then what do you usually do? You come up with excuses on how to get rid of them. So the sale is really over at hello, isn't it? Not at the end. So when you ask both logical based questions and emotional under the surface questions, when you pair them together and you clarify and probe off of their answers and their pain, the answers your prospects give you will serve as a signpost to point you in the needed direction to make the sale. You're gonna discover what problems they have, what's caused the problem, the root cause, like what's behind it, and most importantly, how it's affecting them even personally. Even if you're talking to big CEOs, watch how they cry sometimes when you pull out that much pain. And it doesn't matter what you're selling, even real estate. As you listen to their answers, the correct features of your solution will be matched up to what they told you they're looking for. And in their eyes, you are now becoming someone who cares about them and what they're wanting. You're not just trying to sell them something. They start to view you as the trusted authority, the expert, rather than the dreaded salesperson like they view all the other salespeople. You don't want to be in that category. Now, we can cover you know, some specific NEPQ questions and how that structure works in other trainings that are outside of, of, of today's, if you'd like. Now, okay, so we just went over step number two asking the right questions, but at the right time of the conversation. Now let's talk about step number three. All three of these are very, very important. But step number three is extremely important. If you wanna go from where you are now to becoming a top 1% salesperson in your industry. And it's all about neutralizing. And this is I want you to write this down, eliminating sales pressure. So step number three is eliminating sales pressure. Write that down. You see, it's all about neutralizing the hidden sales pressure that lies in the sales conversations that you're having with your potential customers. Remember, you need to focus on whether or not there's a sale to be made in the first place, whether or not they have problems, whether or not you can help them. When you detach yourself from the expectations of making the sale, you take the pressure out of that conversation and it allows your prospect to feel comfortable opening up to you where they want to engage with you and they want to tell you the truth about their needs in order to move forward with your solution. Now, when your language you use in your conversations is not trust-based, you will immediately trigger sales pressure that leads to sales resistance very quickly. The wall will come up and you know what I'm talking about that. Let me give you an example of this, okay? I'm training a salesperson, just an agent reached out to me a year and a half ago, just randomly, okay? Who was already making, this agent when they came to me, he was already making good income, $25,000 a month. That's great. And that's in the Midwest. It's not a very high end market like New York City but he was still using old traditional selling techniques, a combination of error one and error two sales techniques. Here's what he would always say. Jeremy, every night I go to bed and I feel like, man, I'm, I was just in a boxing match for the day. Like I'm hitting my prospects and hitting and they hit back and, and I'm mentally like worn out every night. Like I'm mentally drained at the end of the day. And I, dude, I don't know what to do. Cause like every six months I have to take three or four weeks off because I'm just mentally broken. Well, why did he feel that way? It's because he was using techniques that work against human behavior that causes friction and sales resistance very quickly with most of his prospects. And it was always an uphill battle to make any sale. 
So he felt like he had to go to war every day. Now he's using techniques. He's using NEPQ or neuroemotion persuasion questions that actually work with human behavior. Whereas prospects pull him in. Guess where his income went? From 25,000 a month to over 110,000 a month in commissions on average. In the last 12 months during a pandemic, he made almost 1.4 million in commissions. Here's the great thing. He's not mentally worn out anymore. He's working less hours and making more than four times the income. You see, when you use neutral languaging properly, you don't trigger resistance and rejection. The correct language is pressure free and your potential clients feel that from you. And I want you to imagine something on how selling would be if your prospects didn't feel any sales pressure, which triggered them to throw out resistance and objections all the time at you. How would selling be different for you than it is right now? Now, let me ask you this. What have you been trained to say when you complete a first call with a client and you're trying to set another call to close them? Maybe you, let's say you called a referral or even cold call someone to try to get their listing in your case with what you sell. You've more than likely been trained to say something like this. And I'm going to give you an example. Brian, I'm so excited. I just love your family and your four kids. It's going to be great. I know that we're the best option for you to get your home sold quickly. You know, we've sold record amounts of homes this year and we're going to do such a great job for you. Now, when can we get together for a, a, an in-home meeting so we can wrap this up for you and get to work? Because we really want to sell that property. Do you want to talk again Thursday afternoon at 1 or Friday at 10? The old option close, right? Well, the problem here is that you're assuming they even want to have another conversation. And when you assume, even if you think they're interested, you become just another salesperson who's trying to sell them something. You sound like every other salesperson or agent who calls them every day. Therefore, there's nothing different about you and their viewpoint. You have now become commoditized in their mind. Traditional selling has conditioned us to focus on what? We've been taught to focus on making the sale. Now, if we don't, we aren't selling. But what happens when you try and persuade them to move things forward on a first call when they obviously are not ready for that because you feel that from their tone? What's lost at that point? Well, you've lost their trust. And it's over at the first conversation. It's over at hello. Now, I'm going to give you a few examples on how to avoid creating pressure for your potential customers because when you try to make them move forward in the sales process, they're just going to resist you. Have you seen that happen to you? They can feel that your intent is to only move them through your sales process so you can make a sale or get the listing. They will feel you're only focused on yourself. And what usually happens next? Well, they throw out the standard objections. They try to get rid of you. You then go into objection handling mode and start trying to convince them why they're wrong and why they should go with you. Then you start chasing them and they don't return your text, your calls, your emails. And it's an ugly pattern and a lot of stressful hard work. Why go through all of that if you didn't have to? Remember, with trust being at its lowest point in the history of the world, if you break trust in the sale, it's over. You lose the sale. Now, let me make myself clear. I don't mean that you shouldn't get the sale. In my 17 sales career in four different industries, I made multiple, multiple seven figures a year in straight commissions as a W-2 salesperson. Now, New York City, that might be considered middle class, barely getting by, but in the industries I was in, no one had ever made even 20% of that in a year. I mean, you can get a 15,000 square foot estate here for like a million and a half in Missouri. <laughs> I don't know what I could get for that in New York City. Do you think I was out to get the sale? You're dang right I was, but I kept that to myself. And I focused on helping my prospects find problems they didn't think they had. And so they viewed me as the authority and they, and I helped them solve those problems. And I got paid a lot of money for that. I even remember a friend from New York city told me I needed to move to New York to sell real estate. I could make five times more. Is that the case? All right. So here's what I mean. Keep your agenda to yourself, focus on them and solving the problem, which means you get the sale. Now let's go back to the same scenario, but we're going to focus at the end of the call. Here's the right way to set up a second call. Je Sally, I enjoyed the conversation. W would it be appropriate for us to have another call to see if what we're doing would fit into what you were looking for with your house? Or Sally, does it make sense for us to have another meeting to see if what we're doing could fit into what you might be looking for? 
does it make sense for us to have another conversation around your home to see if it might be what you're looking for? Now, how do you think your potential customer is going to respond for you saying, would it be appropriate or does it make sense? What do you think they're going to respond? Nope, it would not be appropriate or it would not make sense for you to see if you can help me. Of course, they're not going to say that. They're going to set up another call because you've asked for their permission and you didn't assume they even wanted to do another call. Your prospect will respond with the truth as opposed to using a standard get rid of you response. And what you're doing here is you're humanizing the sales conversation early in the conversation. And they feel that you're actually authentic about helping them. This is one way you create trust and differentiate yourself from your competitors all at the same time. You're going to start hearing your prospects say, so John, what's the next step? Or how do we get started with you to get this going? they will be the ones to start moving the process forward rather than you pressuring them, chasing them and watch as they are the ones that pull you in. How would you feel if your prospects were moving the sale forward instead of you trying to chase them down, hoping and praying that they move forward with you? What's the difference? You see, another way to eliminate any sales pressure is to manage your demeanor. Make sure that you use neutral languaging along with the calm, and relaxed tone. I call that collective confidence. Slow down your pace, have empathy in your voice, verbal pausing, and show that, that you're there for them as opposed to yourself. Now, on the flip side, if you sound robotic, like you're reading from a script, like a telemarketer, do you think your prospects pick up on that? Of course they do. So be calm, be relaxed, and they will become open to your solution and look at you as the trusted authority, the expert instead of how they view all the other salespeople over here. No sales pressure equals far more sales, which means far more money for you and your firm and far more people you are able to help. Now, I'm gonna give you a few other questions and we're gonna end it up for Q&A. These questions you can use at the end of the conversation as well for a second call. I'd love to stand here for 12 hours training you all of this, but we don't have the time. Barry, I enjoyed the conversation. Tell me, how do you, how do you wanna, proceed from here. Now notice you slow down as you ask that question. A verbal pause in the middle is very important to get your prospect to think deeper. Sally, what would be the next step, if any, to see if we can possibly help? Or Cindy, I enjoyed the conversation. Tell me, where do you think we should go from here? See how we pause. See that verbal pause there in the middle. Now, when you ask these type of questions, your prospects feel comfortable with you and they open up to you, all right? So I hope that training helped you today. I've got a lot more I'd love to share with you. Remember today we covered the three steps to be able to sell to today's cautious, skeptical buyer so you can gain a competitive edge. Number one, becoming a problem finder and problem solver, not a product pusher. Number two, asking the right questions, but at the right time. And number three, eliminating sales pressure. Anthony, back to you. Hey, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, that, that was amazing. Um, I, do, I do have some <clears throat> questions that were emailed in from a, attendees that were not able to join us live. Um, they wanted to know, Jeremy, do you just specialize with just real estate brokers or do you help title insurance agents or appraisal firms, bankers selling mortgages? Do you also do all that? Do you help them sell? You know, unfortunately, we train pretty much every industry that's on planet Earth at this point. So Got it. We train Good. hundreds of different industries, real estate brokers, mortgage people, title insurance. I mean, in industries you don't even know exist, we train at this point. We even train right. a company that sells, you know, toilet bowl cleaner, you know, because it's yep. solving a problem. I, I figured that that answer would be yes. Uh, Damien, yes, the you will be getting a copy of this recording. We need about maybe two or three days just to edit it, clean it up, and we're going to put it right onto our site. Yeah. We're also going to be giving it to Jeremy so he can send out a thank you letter as well as his contact information so you can reach out to him and, and you can ask him questions there on uh, thereafter. Yeah, and Anthony, if it helps anybody, um, they are always welcome. We have a, a Facebook group called Sales Revolution. I can have my assistant, Erica, pop that in the group for you guys. Uh, it's a sales. It's called Sales Revolution on Facebook. Uh, we go in there, uh, myself, our sales trainers, and train. We go live about four, five, six times a week. We have a lot of free resources in there. 
that we give access to everybody. So they just join the group. There's a little survey. So we find out kind of what industry they're in and kind of where they're wanting to go. And anybody on here that we're talking to is always welcome to join that. Uh, so you can learn how to sell more of your products and services. In this appreciate case, sell that. more homes. I appreciate that, Jeremy. Uh, Michael Allen, fabulous speaker. Uh, thank you, Michael. <laughs> and Erica Kay, do you train objection handling? Do you yes. train objection handling? Erica Kay. Yeah, because even, even once you learn how to use human behavior in your process, and and because we, we teach a lot of objection prevention. So we would rather learn to ask questions in that conversation that prevent objections from happening in your prospect's mind because it makes selling a lot easier. But you're still gonna have here and there some objections or concerns that come up. And so we train you in our sales training courses, all of our materials that we do, a three-step process to clarify what the objection even means. Because a lot of times when, when a salesperson hears an objection, well, I've heard this before from 100 people and they just rattle off an answer but every prospect is different. Even they're asking the same questions. We have to clarify what's behind them even asking, like what's behind that objection or what's behind that concern. Once we understand what's behind it, then we wanna discuss it like two people working on coming up with the solution to solve it. And then we're gonna ask what are called NEPQ diffusing questions, where we're basically asking them how they see themselves overcoming that themselves, okay? It's what the highest paid psychologists do in the world is they don't tell the patient their problems. They don't tell the patient, you know, here's what you need to do. They ask the right questions that allows the patient to basically understand they have the power to overcome that themselves. It's the same thing. You know, and I was, when I was listening to you, I'm not sure if we have the time to do this. And even if we could do it in three minutes, that'd be great. Do okay. you want to do a quick little role play where I am the buyer or the seller? Because Harden over here is asking, Jeremy, uh, does Jeremy have a script that we can have as questions to be asked the seller? You know, we, so we do, that's more of our advanced sales training. I mean, that's in our courses. Like we, like I said, we've written out thousands of sales structures for different industries. Realtors are one. I mean, we train a lot of realtors. I mean, I, I see hundreds of their testimonials in our Facebook group that we're giving you guys access to. I do know that if he, if he goes into our Facebook group and he messages us in there like, hey, I'm looking for real estate training or whatever, we can have somebody like, hey, here you go, and like post him a little training on this or that that has to do with his industry. Okay, that would be great. And again, everybody, um, we are going to definitely post up, Jeremy. This was a great, this was a great webinar, uh, really informative, especially me being a sales agent as well, selling exhibitors, you know, to, for people to come to our expo. And Jeremy is so right about, you know, being like, um, don't be a product pusher, just be a helper. Always uh, solve the problem, try to help people. And man, that's that's brought me so much success. Problem a, finder. Yeah, problem, problem finder solver. and a solver. Uh, yeah. Because that's that's basically what I've been selling all along, and and, and I'm with them on that one. But yeah. this is so perfect. Um, we got another question. Let's just get to this. One. Yeah, no problem. Michael Allen, Allen, where did you get your tie? Uh, <laughs> where did you get your tie? Oh, that, you, me, <laughs> Michael. You talking about me? Michael Allen, by the way, sells um, food, so he's a caterer. So this awesome. works for him as well. This would work for a food I mean industry fellow. We train a lot in the hospitality uh, company. We train a lot of hotels that when people call in to book hotel rooms, like what to do. I mean, you're, when I say we train everybody, we train every industry, everybody. every product, every service, as long as those people's products or services solve a problem, which every product or service has ever been invented was invented to solve a problem, right? Even cars were meant to solve a problem we train in that industry. It's pretty much everything you can think of at this point. Catering to, hospitality, all of that stuff. That's great. Jeremy, um, oh, we got to, let's see, we got one more person. Oh, thank you, Anthony. Always a great program. Yep, you're so welcome, Arden. Um, your, your products, what are you pushing? What are you promoting right now? What's your, serp, like, what are you selling right now? Uh, classes, Well, we courses, don't push any, we don't push no. any. That's but okay. <laughs> we, do, we do. We do help salespeople and companies solve a lot yes. of problems. So I, like companies and salespeople typically come to us when they're concerned about losing sales to low cost competitors. 
right? Good. They're worried that their salespeople are inconsistently hitting their sales targets. And a lot of times they're concerned about the high attrition because their salespeople just never learn the right skills to really last. So we solve all those problems. So we have sales training courses called NEPQ 2.0 more advanced training called NEPQ 3.0, and then our advanced inner circle. So if they, if they join the Facebook group, if they ever want to know more details about that, they can just message us and somebody will, on our team will message them more details to see if we can help them uh, sell a lot more of their products and services as well. That's the problems we solve for salespeople. Um, okay, Anonymous. Does the group provide any resources to see how NEPQ works? Oh, that's what we have the group for. Yeah, so we just started that group about four or five months ago. We already have about 5,000 people in there, different salespeople. We've got other Facebook groups as well, but that's the one that we do. We go live in most of the time. And so we've got hundreds of different resources in there. So all they have to do is step up on one of our lives and be like, hey, send me more details or info and somebody on my team will message them and uh, get them in Messenger and, and send them different training materials to help them for sure. Uh, that, that's great, Jeremy. Uh, once again, everybody, we will be uploading Jeremy's video onto our newsletter blastings for our remaining webinars for the month of May. Um, so you'll be seeing it a lot over and over. So this will be out. Jeremy will get a list of every attendee that registered for this event, and he will be sending out his contact information and his classes that he offers. Sure. Jeremy, man, thanks a lot. This was great. I yeah. really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, just like I said, if they want to do more and more details, just have them join that Facebook group. We have virtual training courses. We have coaching classes. I mean, we, we're that boring. We just do everything. <laughs> well, listen, I know we're talking uh, with, your, um, with your PR firm, and we would love to have you back in November, and we would love to have you interview some top agents, yeah. some top brokers possibly in, in Manhattan. And, uh, and we'd love to see you again. We definitely well, let me give you an example. You so one of our clients is Ryan Sirhant from Bravo. Uh, you guys probably have heard of him, but sure. we, we don't do any sales training for his realtors, but we, my company, I'm the chairman of seventh level. So uh, our company, we also, we hire and train all of his salespeople that sell his social media products to real estate agents that want to really expand their social media. So we, we know a little bit about real estate, yes. And that's, that's a great client to have. So yeah, again, we're going to be seeing more of you and we want to really thank you, Jeremy. Um, awesome. Thanks, Look Jeremy. forward to seeing you guys hopefully yep. live in November. I, I love these virtual events, but I'm just wanting some human connection. You know, our, our corporate headquarters are in Sydney and I still have, I have not been there for like 15 months because of the pandemic. You can't get in that country. It's sad. It really is sad, but hopefully... Things will get better. I do see a lot of live shows coming back and yeah. I'm excited about going to them. I hope that they're still going to be, you know, offering yeah. them I starting think, in October. I think in October, November, you're yeah. you already seeing yeah. states kind of open up some of the live events now. So definitely. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks, everybody. Anytime, Anthony. Everybody, thank you. Take care, everybody. Be well. Bye-bye.